I'm going to show you a clip of Ed Miliband. What's important is not what he says, but how many times he says it. Just watch this. These strikes are wrong at a time when negotiations are still going on. But parents and the public have been let down by both sides because the government has acted in a reckless and provocative manner. After today's disruption, I urge both sides to put aside the rhetoric, get round the negotiating table and stop it happening again. Um, I listened to your speech in Rex and you talked about the Labour Party being a movement. A lot of people in that movement uh, are the people who are on strike today and they'll be looking at you and thinking, well, you're describing these strikes as wrong. Why aren't you giving us more leadership as a leader of the Labour movement? At a time when negotiations are still going on, I do believe these strikes are wrong. And that's why I say both sides should, after today's disruption, get round the negotiating table, put aside the rhetoric and sort the problem out. Because the public and parents have been let down by both sides. The government's acted in a reckless and provocative manner. Well, I spoke to Francis Moore before I came here and the tone he was striking was a very conciliatory one. Do you think there's a difference between the words they're saying in public and the attitude they're striking in private in these negotiations? Are there negotiations in good faith, would you say? What I say is that the strikes are wrong when negotiations are still going on, but the government has acted in a reckless and provocative manner in the way it's gone about these issues. After today's disruption, I urge both sides to get around the negotiating table, put aside the rhetoric, and stop this kind of thing happening again. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a statement you've made uh, publicly and you'll make to me, and this will be broadcast, obviously, but have you spoken privately to any uh, union leaders and, and expressed your view to them on a personal level, would you say? Well, what I say in public and in private to everybody involved in this is get round the negotiating table, put aside the rhetoric and stop this kind of action happening again. These strikes are wrong because negotiations are still going on, but parents and the public have been let down by the government as well, who've acted in a reckless and provocative manner. Um, you're a parent, I'm a parent, a lot of people watching this will be parents. Um, has it affected you personally, this action? Has it affected your family, your friends? I mean, and, and what is the net effect of that going to be on, on parents having to take a day off work today? I think parents up and down the country have been affected by this action. Uh, and it's wrong at a time when negotiations are still going on. Parents have been let down by both sides because the government has acted in a reckless and provocative manner. I think that both sides should, after today's disruption, get round the negotiating table, put aside the, the rhetoric, rhetoric and stop, stop this kind of thing. Again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. Five times. Five times he said exactly the same thing. Now, what that tells me is that those words have been written down and pretty much learned. And I would ask the question, who has written those words? Has he written them and learned them? Someone else written them and learned them? If someone else has written them and he learned them, that means he's... 100% a puppet. But let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he wrote them down and learned them. Is that the behaviour of a leader? Not in my opinion. The only thing that we should be saying to the likes of Ed Mil Miliband, and I would include David Cameron, Theresa May and Hagen, the lot of them, the only question we should be getting involved with them is take me to your leader. <laughs> That's it. Because he's not the leader and neither is David Cameron. Kamala Bot needs a tune-up. The VP finally getting herself out there with more interviews and chit-chat with journalists, but her style so far has been robotic. Whenever asked to give policy specifics, Harris reverts to her pre-programmed, over-rehearsed talking points. Check out this rinse, blather, repeat. I was raised as a middle-class kid. I grew up a middle-class kid. I grew up a middle-class kid. I intend to create an opportunity economy. Creating an opportunity economy. Building an opportunity economy. What I call an opportunity economy. I started my career as a prosecutor. I was a career prosecutor for most of my career. My career. Having a background as a prosecutor. <laughs> the programmer is still trying to work out the bugs in Kamala Bot. She's only got two settings, word salad and pander politics. VP Harris testing out her latest accent while speaking to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus in Washington. Listen. Um, I love you back. <laughs> I grew up understanding the children of the community are the children of the community. Recently, I was in Nevada. I'm, I'm in these streets, let me tell you, I'm everywhere. <laughs> we have some work to do. In fact, a lot of hard work ahead of us. But we like hard work. Hard work is good work. Hard work is joyful work, I say. Oh, God, so embarrassing. All right, Dana, mm -hmm. 
Uh You could ask her, what are we going to do about the situation in Gaza? And she'd say, well, I was raised in a middle class family. Actually, her line on that one is, I won't give Israel what they need to defend themselves, but Israel has a right to defend itself. That's actually, she knows that line and she used it yesterday. Um, She's doing what I call prevent defense. There we go, D.D. So they want to make no news for the next 47 days, right? They're in survivor 47 days. So her goal is to not give President Trump anything to be able to use against her. Now, you can make fun. Everybody can make fun of her and say she only has these five lines. She recycles them all the time. She comes up with the accent in order to fit with the group. But, But here's what she needs. She has to keep her base. And they have already factored in the Teamsters situation. They would have loved to have had the endorsement. They did not get the endorsement. That is a big Blow. Well, it's, it, it's great for Trump. I, what I was told by some Democrats today is that we've already factored it in. We already knew that we weren't going to have those people because they already knew what the polls looked there. But you cannot win a news cycle if you are playing it so safe. Now, Trump is going to play the news cycle. He's going to play it. Sometimes he's going to win it. Sometimes he's going to lose it. But there's also a school of thought. I'm not exactly sure where I sit on it, but it is that whoever, <laughs> whoever this race is about is the one who's going to lose. So what Kamala Harris wants is for everyone to be talking about Trump all the time because it worked in 2020. It was, that was the basement campaign. So now she's hiding in plain sight by doing some of these safe events, but not rocking the boat so much that you would actually get a lot of news made because the news she would make would be something like the interview she did when she was at the White House. And then after that, she would be asked to go to her room for six months. The risk is to that strategy is that these clips are now the news. Everyone's seeing her say the same thing over and over again, and that makes her look bad, Greg. Well, I disagree with calling her robotic. It's more liquidy, like she's like a liquidy robot, a slinky. Mm. If a slinky could talk, that's her. And maybe because I've watched too much Selling Sunset, but it's very wine chatty. Like she needs a little chihuahua and espresso martini. She seems super relaxed. I love how she uses this phrase, opportunity economy. All she did was reverse economic opportunity. (laughs) (laughs) And then she doesn't explain what it is. Opportunity economy doesn't mean anything. Economic opportunity does. I think if you want her to blow a fuse, okay, because she keeps talking about, I come from a middle-class family. Some reporters should ask, where do you come from growing up? (laughs) She might actually answer with a specific statistic about what to do about inflation. Because she'll have like, (laughs) she'll go, I come from, um, wait a second, I can't answer with the right answer. I can beat inflation by blah, blah, blah. It could just like little steam will come out of her head. But it's a testament to how Joe Biden is, was, that the Dems are grateful for that. Mm. Judge Jeanine, uh, we've seen so many times her not really saying much. Did you hear when she said um, the children of the community are the, oh, children, the children of the, the community? community. Yeah, what do you think she means by that? She did, were you the one who was just saying how two smart times, two she times. was? <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know what? When she talks about it, she says, I grew up middle class. You know what? Donald Trump may have grown up more upper class, but he understands the middle class and he understands Americans and what they need better than she does. He understands it. He proved it when he was president and he continues to talk about the issues. And Dana's right. All that they're trying to do is she doesn't want to make news. All she wants to do is do these interviews where she doesn't really answer any questions so that we can't complain and say she's not doing any interview interviews. And Brian Fallon, um, who's one of the senior spokespersons, yeah. says, you know what, if you want to know uh, what we do or what she would do, look at all the things she was doing before the ticket switch. Even her spokespeople can't tell you what she's going to do, uh, except to refer to what she was doing before the ticket switch. And all she was doing was laughing and giggling. And so in the end, they can't tell you anything. They're gaslighting us and they're trying to make us feel like we're crazy. But I think the most important question when you're a kid, you learn who, what, where, when and how. Right. And why. All right. She doesn't know how. And I don't think she knows why. If you ask Kamala Harris, why are you running for president? I'm sure she'd be stuck 
But the best answer she could probably give is to beat Donald Trump, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying something about bettering this country, about maybe Donald Trump would say, making America great again. Mm -hmm. You know, she's just, she's robotic. She's liquid. She's not really smart. She's a slinky. <laughs> and to Dana's point, you know, she says she's playing prevent defense. What happens when you play prevent defense? You prevent yourself from winning, Harold. So first of all, I like the B.B. King music. Um, look, I wish I was going to be here the next Thank two you. days of here as well. That's two like saying defense. you come from a middle class family. The thing like B.B. King? I'm from He's running out the He's clock. He's like, let me yeah. run out this yeah. clock. So you say prevent yeah. defense. When President Trump, after the first debate, which he was defeated in by the dumb vice president, uh, <laughs> after that debate, he said that he won. And he said... Assume, let's assume he's right. I don't think he is. He said, I don't, if you're the champion, you don't give a second debate to the, to the loser. So he was playing his own version yeah. of prevent defense and saying, I'm going to use this strategy. I'm not convinced that strategy works for either. Mm -hmm. The pres vice president says that she wants an opportunity economy. It would be great if she'd give us some elements. What does an opportunity economy look like? Is it more affordable? Is it more affordability for everyday Americans to buy a home, to raise their kids, to buy groceries, to buy gas, to pay for education? Uh, is it stim stimulus or tax cuts for small businesses? Maybe their first million dollars of a small business, you cut taxes in half of them. Give us some meat on the bill. And I would argue President Trump has not given us this either. He has said, look back to what I did five, six, seven, eight years ago. Most people don't know what they did five hours ago, five days ago, five months ago, let alone five years ago. Both of them would do better, which is what I was the only thing I was trying to say in the first segment. They should both sit down, and we deserve to hear, see them stand side by side and have very tough questions. I would agree with you, Judge. I wish different questions had been asked the last debate. I think Martha and Brett would do a far better job at asking these questions. So you can't play prevent defense. No one wants to see, see that happen. The thing I learned from the things you said a minute or two ago, Judge, I don't agree with anything, but that last thing, who, what, when, who, what, where, when, when how, how, and why. Oh, I like that. I'm going to use that. You got I'm going to give you Not credit today. for doing it. Well, I'll start with this. Um, I grew up a middle class kid. My mother raised my sister and me. She worked very hard. Um, she was able to finally save up enough money to buy our first house when I was a teenager. Um, I grew up in a community of hardworking people, you know, construction workers and nurses and teachers. And I try to explain to some people who may not have had the same experience, you know, if, if but a lot of people will relate to this. You know, I grew up in a neighborhood of folks who were very proud of their lawn, 